We are going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 for the next four weeks. If you've got your Bible, I want to encourage you to turn there. Uh, we are going to spend the next four weeks on just three verses of Scripture. Uh, for what it's worth, this is my favorite way to teach Scripture. I, I know there's importance in the big, broad strokes where we kind of bounce from passage to passage. I love to just kind of dig into one small chunk of Scripture and really unpack word for word, phrase for phrase, what's in there. And so what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is I'm going to read the entirety of these three verses to kind of open service every week. And then we're just going to focus on one little clause at a time. A part of the reason we're going to read the whole thing every week is so that you get it in context. But part of the reason we're going to read the whole thing every week is I want to challenge you over the next month to commit these words to memory. This is one of those passages that if at some point you never memorized this piece of Scripture, these are some good words to have written on your heart. They talk to us about what God has done and who God is, and then they finish by talking about who we are because of what God has done and what our response to Him ought to be. So if you've never memorized Ephesians 2, 8-10, through 10, I'm just going to challenge you over the next four weeks, you read it every day too, until those words are ingrained on your heart and on your mind. So here's the entirety of the passage we're going to study together over the next month or so. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8-10. through 10. For by grace you are saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are His creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. This morning, we're going to focus just on that first line, that we are saved by grace through faith. That first line contains three of the most important theologically rich words in the New Testament. So I know you're going to be excited about this, but this morning you're going to get some Greek. It's going to be awesome. But you take notes in Greek for me, all right? I want to see what your alpha looks like. Um, that was supposed to be a joke, but apparently not. A little too anxious about that. A little too intimidated by the Greek. Um, I just really am going to talk about three words this morning. So that means it's going to be a three-word sermon. Don't worry, I'll still fill the full half hour. Um, there we got some chuckles. Good. Just making sure you're with me. Word number one. You have been saved. The Greek word that's here is the word sozos. And it means this according to the lexicon. It means to deliver someone out of danger and into safety. To deliver someone out of danger and into safety. Now, the image that came to mind for me was the image of the Chilean miners. Do you remember that story from about a decade or so ago? A group of 33 miners were working in a gold copper mine in Chile, and the mine collapsed on them, and they were stuck down there. And for the first few days, they survived on emergency rations. If you read the story, they got two bites of food and a drink of milk each day. That's what they had to live on. After a few days, eventually one of the exploratory uh, tunnels found them. They were sending these little tiny scopes to see if they could find the miners who were stuck underground. And eventually they could send messages back and forth and were able to shuttle supplies in. Those miners were trapped underground, if you don't remember, for 67 days. Nearly 10 weeks buried in the ground. They were in a place of danger. In danger of suffocation, in danger of starvation, in danger of the mind collapsing further. For 67 days, they lived in a place of danger. But through much planning and careful drilling, they opened up a shaft where they could lift the miners up one by one, and all 33 miners were brought and had their feet placed on solid ground again. This is the picture when you hear that word saved, delivered from a place of danger. They were in a place where their lives were threatened and they were delivered to a place of safety. It does not make light of that second part. The safety part is really important. If they had been brought out of the mine and placed in shark infested pools, that would not have been rescue, right? They would have moved from one place of danger to the other, out of the frying pan into the fire, we say, so to speak. Rescue or saving involves delivering from a place of danger and moving them to a place of safety. What does this have to do with the gospel? Everything. Absolutely everything. For every human being who's ever walked the face of the planet, apart from Jesus Christ, are in danger. 
They are in danger of death. Not physical death. That's going to come to all of us anyway. They're in danger of the type of spiritual death that lasts in eternity. They're in danger of an eternal destiny where they are separated from God and all of His goodness and all of His life and all of His hope and all of His joy for all of eternity. They are in danger of what the Bible calls hell. Because God is some cruel, vindictive God, but because they have chosen to rebel against Him. We all have chosen to rebel against Him. Each of us in our own way, chasing our own forbidden fruit, looking at God and going, I think I know better than you. And choosing to live our way rather than His way. And as a consequence of that rebellion, all of us are in danger. And the Gospel story is a process of God delivering us from danger and placing us in safety. Moving us from the kingdom of death to the kingdom of life. From the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Moving us from that destiny of condemnation to a destiny where we dwell with Him forever. Held in His hands. And nothing ever able to harm us. That's why for years, one of the most hopeful verses in Scripture is Romans 8, right? We get to the end of Romans 8 and Paul says, What can separate me from the love of God? There's nothing in the past or the present or the future that can separate me from the love of God. There's nothing in this world or the world that is to come. There's nothing in this life, not even death itself, has the power to separate me from the love of God. When the Bible says saved, sozos, it means we were in a place where we were in mortal danger and we were delivered from danger to a place of eternal safety held in the hands of a loving God. For you have been saved by grace, he says. Grace is the Greek word charis. Grace means, and I want to read this one to you because it's, it's beautifully, this is what the lexicon says. It says, charis is God freely extending His favor to people because He is predisposed to bless them and be with them. God freely extending His favor to people because He is disposed to bless them and be with them. I'm going to kind of go down a little bit of a rabbit trail here, but circle back at some point. Um, I coached junior high football for the better part of a decade. Um, and most junior high football players, look, I had hair once upon a time, almost. <laughs> Most junior high football players are about as talented as you expect a seventh grader to be. Okay, they kind of look like clumsy llamas running around, and every once in a while you'll find one who's pretty good. And in my, my 10 years, I had two that were special. And you knew right away. You knew from the first practice, that kid is not like those kids. He's faster, he's, he's more athletic, he's got better balance, he's more skilled. And for what it's worth, the first, when they were 12 years old and walked into seventh grade practice, I knew that no matter how hard the rest of my kids worked, they were never going to be that kid. No matter how many sprints they ran, no matter how many hills they ran, or weights they lifted, there was something in these kids that made them different from everybody else. It's not just athletics. I remember a young lady who was in our youth group about 15 years ago. When she was 13, she was playing a company at piano for symphony orchestras, okay? When she was 15, she was the house pianist for Mount Union College. So when their choir or their symphony played, she was the one playing the piano for them at 15. At 16, she released an album of concertos and sonatas that she had written. Did she have a good piano teacher? Yes. Did she practice really hard? Yes. Was there something different about her than every other piano student I've ever met? Yes. There was something in her that was different from what everybody else has. When you and I offer love and forgiveness to people, it often comes at great effort. It often comes with us having to swallow our pride. We often spend years before we're able to forgive somebody. God is not like that. Because there's something in Him that is unique to His character. His grace is not something we beg for. 
It is not something we have to earn. It's not something He gives reluctantly. When the Bible says grace, it means God shows favor freely and willingly because He is predisposed to bless and be with His people. The very core of His identity is that He is one who forgives and loves and provides and wants to be with His people despite our errors, despite our shortcomings, despite our brokenness. The Old Testament has a phrase for this. You read it all through the prophets that God is slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. Slow to become angry and abounding in faithful love. You ever fill a pitcher so full that the water begins to pour over because you weren't paying attention? Or you open a can of soda that's got too much carbonation and it goes everywhere? That's abounding. There's more there than can be held. The container's not big enough to keep it all in. Abounding in faithful love. You are saved, moved from danger to safety, not because of your goodness or your worthiness or your church attendance or your scripture memory or your t- You are saved because God is bounding in faithful love. And the very fiber of His being is a desire to bless and be with His people. He is the one who acts. We are simply the objects of His mercy. He says we are saved by grace through faith. The lexicon definition, at least the short version, this one actually gets a whole page in my Greek lexicon. I pulled just a sentence for today. Faith means to trust, or it means to believe and trust in someone's word. To believe and trust in someone and their word. And I like that image of belief and trust together. For years, I've used the image of a kid jumping into a swimming pool. Anybody who's ever had a young kid, you've done this thing where you stand in the pool and your kid stands on the edge of the pool and you put your arms out and you go, come on, buddy, jump, I'll catch you. Jump, I won't let you get hurt. I love you, you know I'm here. Jump, I've got you. And sometimes you get really frustrated, like, just jump for it. No, oh, well, not, I was never like that, but some of you aren't as loving as I am. Um, in order for that kid to jump, Two things must be true. One, he must believe you. He must believe your words. He he does love me. He does want to keep me safe. He is going to catch me. I believe the things that he says. But secondly, I trust him. I trust that he's actually strong enough to catch me. I trust that he's not going to change his mind mid-jump and turn around and leave me to drown. I don't know why my kids thought that, but... um, In order for a kid to jump, he must believe what you say, and then he must trust that you are able and willing to do what you have said. And we look at that through the lens of what it means to have faith in God. It means both of those things. I believe the things about God and about Jesus are true. I believe Jesus came and walked on this earth. I believe under Pontius Pilate. I believe that he was laid in a tomb and I believe that he walked out of that tomb and rose again. And more importantly, or just as importantly, I believe that he ascended to the right hand of God where he intercedes on my behalf and speaks to the Father for me. I believe those things to be true. But belief is not enough. James says that even the demons believe there's one God and they tremble. I know lots of people who believe things. Faith is belief with trust. Not only do I believe those things, but I trust Him with my whole life. I will lean the full weight of my soul upon what He has done. I have no desire to try to earn my way into heaven, to try to be good enough, to try to prove anything. I will trust in the work of Jesus with all that I am. I not only believe it, but I believe it enough to jump. It's one thing to stand on the side of the pool and say, yeah, my dad would catch me if I ever jumped. It's a completely different thing to jump and say, catch me. And this Greek word, pistis, which means to trust and believe in somebody and their word, means at some point you're willing to jump and trust that God, through His Son Jesus, will catch you. So we take those three words and we put it together and we get this beautiful, beautiful story. For by grace, purely because God is love, purely because God is predisposed to show us favor, 
purely because God is overflowing with compassion and mercy. By grace, we are saved. We are moved from a place of danger to a place of safety and security. We are moved from a destiny apart to an eternal destiny with God. We are rescued. We are saved through faith. This happens the moment we decide that we believe the words of Jesus and we are willing to trust Him with our whole life and our whole soul. And we jump and we say, catch me because nothing else can hold me up. Paul begins this beautiful explanation of the gospel with this profound phrase, for by grace you are saved through faith. And it is a beautiful, beautiful promise. I want to leave you with one last image this morning. We've entitled the series Blank Canvas, uh, in part because I I want to talk about... uh, an image that will appear later on in the text. And the version we read, it says, you are God's creation. Uh, I always grew up hearing the phrase, you are God's masterpiece. And so we're going to talk about that when we get there, what it means to be God's creation or workmanship or masterpiece. And this image of a God who creates us anew into something glorious. And so we're going to talk about that here in a couple of weeks. But before you can get to that point, we have to talk about Saved by grace through faith. And so the metaphor that I had in my mind was, imagine with me for a moment, for whatever reason, that the Metropolitan Museum of Art called me up and said, Josh, we would like for you to paint a picture to hang in our gallery. Now you may not know this about me, but the only thing I do worse than sing is draw. Okay? I took high school choir, okay? because I needed a fine arts credit and that seemed less intimidating than art class. And so I painted a masterpiece for the Metropolitan Museum of Art and it looks like this, it's beautiful. (laughs) That's me when I had hair, it's a self-portrait. And it was a little skinnier, I think, apparently. Um, If I take that masterpiece to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, what do you think their response is going to be? It's modern art. It's awesome. I don't think that's how that's going to go. Um, I, think, I think I will be rejected. I think I will be told that I do not measure up to their standards. I think that they will find my best efforts a little lacking. And while most of you, I hope, are better at painting a picture than I am, I need you to know that when we talk about things from a spiritual perspective, your best efforts will always be lacking. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And your way of doing that is different than mine. You might struggle with dishonesty or with greed or with pride or with selfishness or with lust or with sexual morality or with anger. You might struggle. I don't know what your, your thing is. But I'm just telling you the standard to be right with God apart from Jesus is perfection. You must be your own masterpiece. You must be so good that I can't tell the difference between your righteousness and God's righteousness. And I want you to know that no matter how good you are, when we compare your righteousness to God's righteousness, it's like hanging my picture next to the Mona Lisa. It becomes pretty clear that one person was a master and one person was me. And so, on our own merits... We are rejected. There's a thing that artists occasionally do when they have a picture that uh, they don't think is worthy, they've messed it up, but they don't want to throw the canvas out. Sometimes they'll do this thing where they whitewash canvases. And they'll take some white paint and they will paint over the picture that they no longer want to be there. And they will coat it so thick that when they are done, You can't even tell that there was another picture underneath of it. And sometimes in their best efforts, it will take two or three or four coats. But slowly but surely, they will create a brand new canvas that can be painted on again. And before, I am dripping all over the floor and I'm going to get in trouble for that. I'm going to have to clean the carpet when we're done. Sorry, Judy. 
I'm not dripping, it's dripping off the canvas. I'm being very neat and clean. Before God can turn us into His masterpiece, before He begins to transform us into His beautiful, masterful creation, He starts by erasing what is there. By covering our inadequacy with the righteousness of Jesus. By covering our imperfections with the holy Jesus. There's a reason Paul says things like, I am crucified in Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Because Paul was not good enough to have a relationship with God, but Christ in Paul was sufficient enough to satisfy the requirements. There's a reason Paul writes things like, um, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has or God made him who had no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Or take off the old self and clothe yourself with Christ. Those images are there for a reason because our best effort will never be good enough. And so God, by grace, through faith, wipes the canvas clean. And then as we'll find out here in a couple weeks, makes us into masterpieces through His and His work in our hearts and lives. This is the Gospel message. This is why the Gospel can never be about us, but can only be about Him. Because He's the one who planned it, He's the one who accomplished it, and He is all of the glory. We have no hope but the blood of Jesus given as an act of grace from a God predisposed to show favor and be with His people. We're going to sing about that here in just a moment. That God sent His Son as that act of grace. And I'm just going to invite you, if you don't yet have that relationship, you don't yet know Jesus in that way, if you have painted your own little painting and found it wanting, I want you to know that that will never be good enough. And as we sing these words about the blood of Jesus, that nothing can make us whole again except for the grace of God displayed in the work of Christ. I'd love the opportunity to share the gospel with you even further. And whether you're watching along online and you want to send us a message, or you're here in the room and you want to come have a conversation, don't wait another day. There is no hope but the grace given by God and the faith we place in Him that moves us from a place of death to a place of life. Saved by grace through faith. Father, we cannot... Thank you enough for your grace. There are not words that are sufficient. It is undeserved. It is unmerited. It is unearned. It is your gift, given freely, because of who you are. And so God, we, we simply come and offer every ounce of praise and thanksgiving we have. For we know that we have no hope but the hope you offer. We sing these words as a proclamation, as a prayer, and as a truth. There's nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus that brings us what we're looking for. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for showing it to us. In Jesus' name, amen.